get started. If you would bow your heads, we'll ask God's blessing. Our Heavenly Father, our great Almighty God, we thank you so much for the breath of life that you've given to us. We thank you, Father, for the wonderful future that you hold out to us. We seek first your kingdom and pray that you'll help us to, to do that every day. We realize that man doesn't have the answers and there are all out assaults upon marriage and family and, and gender. And it's just a uh, very troubling times that we live in. We pray father for your mercy for the suffering of so many of our brethren that we have scattered around the world. We pray especially for Mrs. Norma Holiday, who has had a fall and broken hip, broken femur, and, and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Holiday have served valiantly for probably close to 60 years in the, in the, the work of the church. We pray for many others, Father, and now as we gather here, we thank you for the, the means of having a meeting like this over the internet. We pray that the connection, that everything will work well. And uh, so we just ask your presence and your inspiration as we look a bit further into the book of Hebrews. We thank you. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Could I see a thumbs up? Can you see the screen? Okay. The notes. All right. Great. All right. Well, we'll... Uh, We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, notes, actually, I have them here at the end of Hebrews 6. We, uh, we ended up with the thought here of the two immutable things that are mentioned, uh, the promise that God made to Abraham, uh, the oath that he took when he, he, uh, he swore that uh, Jesus would be the uh, priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So, um, and then uh, the, it ended with Jesus being the forerunner, being the, the, uh, the pioneer, the scout, the one who blazes the trail for the rest of us to follow along to make the journey easier for those who follow afterward. So now let's, uh, let's go ahead and get into chapter seven. I mentioned last time that it will expand even more on this concept of Melchizedek. Uh, we touched on it in chapter five, but we'll go more so to Melchizedek uh, in this uh, particular chapter. Verse one, for this Melchizedek. Now, the word means king of righteousness. Uh, Josephus also refers to this account back in Genesis 14, and he says that the name means king of righteousness. But then King of Salem, so that's another title. He is the King of Righteousness. He is also the King of Salem. Uh, Salem comes from the Hebrew word shalom, meaning peace. And he is also a priest. Uh, he is a king slash priest, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. So this, again, we looked at it in the Sermon on the Fundamental Belief on Tithing uh, just this last week, but uh, we also referred to a last Bible study. But Genesis 14 tells that story. Uh, I won't be turning back there uh, here this, with this Bible study. But the, you know, the order in which they're listed, it's interesting that righteousness comes before Peace can be given. Righteousness, the, the uh, holy living comes first, and then we are given a relationship with the Father through Christ. Uh, as in Romans 5, verse 1, it says, uh, Therefore, having been justified, justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But in verse 2, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. And so we just commented on that. But uh, again, tithe, uh, the word is used and uh, a little later in the chapter, but tithe is from the old English word that means 
tenth, giving a tenth. And so Abraham came back after um, the Battle of the Kings and then Lot being taken off and Abraham and his his own servants and, and other allies went and brought them all back and he paid tithes to Melchizedek. Now in verse three, this Melchizedek without father. So this is very important here, without mother, without genealogy. You see, he's he's comparing and contrasting the, the Levitical priesthood with the Melchizedek priesthood. In the Levitical priesthood, as you remember, the tribe of Levi among the 12 was set aside for the service of the tabernacle. Moses, Miriam, and Aaron were of the tribe of Levi, but specifically Aaron was, was appointed the first high priest. His sons after him, of course, two were killed, but then Eleazar, you had other high priests. You had this priestly line that served across the ages. I read somewhere where, where they estimated there were 83 high priests who served from that time of about 1400s BC until the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So that's that really is not very many men. I mean, when you think about it, the high priest who on the Day of Atonement, atonement annually was the one person to go behind the second veil. That's not many men who had that privilege and honor. But a Levitical priest would have to demonstrate by a clear, undisputed genealogy. They would have to prove that they were of the tribe of Levi and specifically that they were of the line of Aaron within Levi or they could not serve as a priest. With the story in Ezra and Nehemiah, if you do a search back through there, some of the priests that came back from Babylon had lost their genealogical record. And so they were not able to serve to, but they had to be able to prove that they were of this line. Now, and it says, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Okay. Uh, Denise just, okay, looks like it is froze up. Okay, I see some of you moving. Can you hear me? Just about okay. three, three okay. seconds. Just about three seconds. Uh, we're able okay. to continue to uh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry for the interruption but Denise came up and told me that uh, that she had lost my audio so we're uh, we're good to go again um, neither beginning of days or end of life that means eternal but made like the son of God made like the son of God remains a priest continually so he is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He is like the Son of God. He is eternal in this role of king priest. Now, the story back in Genesis 14 uh, was told, and I covered this Sabbath in the Sermon on Tithing, but it was in the context of God owning everything. As it said in the Genesis account, he is the possessor of heaven and earth. God gave the victory to Abraham or Abram, as he was known by that name, by that time. Uh, the spoils were Abraham's to do as he pleased, and he chose to give a tithe. And so he tithed on all the spoils. So continuing in verse 4, now consider how great this man was. So Melchizedek, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. So now Abraham, by the Jewish people, they viewed Abraham as their greatest ancestor. Now, really, there were two men. You had Abraham as the original patriarch, and then you had Moses, the one later on God used and through whom the through through Moses the law was given and the 
covenant was, was established. So, um, verse 5, and indeed those who were of the sons of Levi who received the priesthood. So not all Levites are priests, only the line of Aaron. Have a commandment. So again, we covered last Sabbath, Numbers 18, other areas you have laws of tithing that became, that were folded into the Old Covenant. However, tithing was here long before, and therefore, after the Old Covenant, tithing continues. But the priests had a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law that is from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. So Levi, in that sense, received tithes from the other tribes. The Levites gave a tenth of that tithe to those who specifically were priests. Now, let me scroll these notes up a little bit. Okay, verse, uh, verse 6 then, but he, so he's shifting back to Melchizedek, he whose genealogy is not derived from them, from the Levites, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. So by that time, there were promises from Genesis 12 and on that God had given to the patriarch Abraham. But Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Verse 7, now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. You know, we see that in so many biblical examples. We have uh, uh, like uh, Jacob passing along a blessing to all of his sons and then his grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh. But the better Melchizedek blessed the lesser Abraham in this story. Verse 8 here, so down here on earth, mortal men received tithes. It was still happening. Levites were still functioning, and they were receiving the tithes of the people, but this was a transitional age. But there, okay, referring to Melchizedek with an eternal priesthood, there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. Verse 9, even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak. So don't, don't let that be too confusing. It's, it's a figure of speech. Uh, Levi was a descendant of Abraham. So in that sense, through Abraham, all of the descendants of Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Let's see. Verse 10, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So Levi was a great grandson. So again, he's, he's making the case. I mentioned this last time. He's speaking of the superiority of the high priesthood of Jesus Christ after the, Mel Mel the order of Melchizedek. So continuing here in verse 11. If perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, so by the, word, the way it's worded, we realize perfection, salvation, eternal life was not going to come through the, the Levitical system. For under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? Verse 12, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is a change of the law. Okay, now the Levitical priests served as the mediators between God and Israel. Uh, they taught the law. They, as the sacrifices were added after, you know, with the events of the first year, they offered sacrifices. They also served as judges of the people. They would hear various matters and make determinations. Uh, however, the Levitical priesthood was fallible because it involved sinful, carnal human beings. The Levitical priesthood had its limitations. 
and uh, could not bring perfection. But a change was coming, a change of the law. There were laws of the administration of the priesthood that were going to be modified. Uh, certainly there was a change in the laws of tithing because you see uh, the book of Hebrews is preparing the, the rem this remnant of the Jewish people for the fact that the temple is going to be restored and there will be no holy place. And so instead of during this transitional age from the death of Christ to the destruction of the temple, you see some of the Jewish Christians could have given their tithes to the local Levite, or they could have given it to the ministry of the Church of God. It was transitioning to where that spiritually the Levites were the ministry of the church. So a change is being made. Verse 13, for of for he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe. What tribe was Jesus from? Well, he obviously was of the tribe of Judah. You just have to go back to Matthew 1. You have the genealogy of Christ, and he clearly is a son of David. Matthew is making that abundantly clear, and David is clearly of the tribe of Judah. He came from Judah. So, belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. So by the laws of the Old Testament that it set aside Levi to do this work, we now have a problem. Well, no, we don't. God, God has it covered. Uh, the, the author, Paul, is, is explaining, looking at it from interesting ways, different directions. And in verse... Um, Verse 14, for it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Priesthood. Okay. Hang on here. I just had a, a warning thing that came up that I've never seen before, but I... I have my scriptures on the screen on the far left, and I have my notes that you're seeing, and um, they slightly overlapped, and I had a message that told me to move the one application away from the other. So I uh, learned something new every day. All right, so moving the notes on up in verse 15, for it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. So again, comparing, contrasting Levi and Melchizedek, an endless life. Verse 17, for he testifies. Now he goes back, as we read last time in Bible study, he goes back and he quotes from Psalm 110. Uh, starts out, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Well, in verse 4, it says, uh, back in Psalm 110, verse 4, it says, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So it weaves together this, this one David calls, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. But then in verse 4, you are a priest forever. And so it ties together the God of the Old Testament, Jesus Christ, Melchizedek. It's just, it, it's all in the same individual here. Verse 18, for on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. Now, the problem was not with, with God. It was not with God's law. The problem was with the people and the fact that carnal human beings could not keep the law. There was sin, and there was a sacrificial system given to continually remind them of that ultimate sacrifice that was yet ahead. Verse 19, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope. Now, remember in the introduction, I told you, let's watch for the word better. 
better covenant, better hope, better promises. And here's this word again, through which we draw near to God. So a better hope is provided through Jesus Christ, who now serves as our living high priest, mediating on our behalf. Verse 20 and inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him. All right, now he's going to go back and he's quoting once again in verse or in uh, Psalm 110, verse 4. The Lord has sworn. So this is God took an oath. God can take oaths because he has all power to make it come to pass. We are counseled, don't make oaths because you may make a promise you can't carry through on. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So the Levitical priesthood was established without an oath. God just told Moses, tell Aaron, you're a high priest, and etc. cetera. Um, their role was determined by their legal lineage, their pedigree. But Jesus was made a priest forever by God taking an oath. Verse 22, by so much more, Jesus has become a surety. Uh, this is the, uh, the guarantee, the margin says, the guarantee of a better covenant. So there's the word better again. He is our guarantee. Now, a better covenant. We now begin, he begins transitioning, preparing to where he's going to go in chapter 8. In chapter 8, he's going to go back to Jeremiah 31 with what is said about the new covenant that will be established. That is the better covenant. Verse 23, also there were many priests because they were pre prevented by death from continuing. And as I said a while ago, uh, approximately 83 high priests served, and, and we don't know how many, uh, what surely was tens of thousands of of uh, priests of the line or that came from the line of Levi uh, across those years. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So verse, uh, uh, well, anyhow, I want to keep reading here. Verse 26, for such a high priest was fitting for us, and look at the, the words, the descriptors he uses. Who is holy, harmless, so he's without any, any blemish or fault, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. So that's uh, awfully high praise, very high deserved praise for Jesus Christ who does not need daily as those high priests, those Levitical priests, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. So pause right there. The, well, the Day of Atonement, we'll focus quite a bit on that as we get to chapter 9, but the Day of Atonement, remember with the ritual, the high priest would first offer, I believe it was a bullock, for his own sins and the sins of his own family. Then later he would go back with the blood of, of the goat uh, for the sins of the people. But there is no longer a need with Jesus Christ to live the perfect sin-free life. Okay, this he did for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, God swore you're a high priest forever, appoints the son who has been perfected forever. So 
Jesus offered himself once and for all, all mankind and for all time. Um, there's no longer a need for animal sacrifices to be offered over and over and over. They were temporary. They pointed to the ultimate sacrifice. They reminded Israel of their sins. But God will now no longer work in the same way through the Levitical system, but directly through Jesus Christ as high priest. And the tithes of the people go to the work of the church not the service of the tabernacle. So the administration of tithing was modified. The laws of tithing remain. There's a different application, a different administration. Okay, that's chapter seven, and I hope that's clear enough. Uh, verse, verse, or rather chapter eight, a uh, shorter chapter here, but uh, again, he's it's these these central. Chapters seven, eight, nine are uh, extremely important uh, in uh, the comparing and contrasting of high priests, of covenants, of um, sacrifices versus the the one ultimate sacrifice. Verse eight. Now, this is the main point of things we're saying. So he said, you know, this is the aha moment. This this is where we are. Uh, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty of, in the heavens. When this was written, we we're probably looking at just one, two years before the temple is destroyed. He's telling the Jews, the Jewish Christians in particular, this system of which I'm speaking is already functioning. We have this high priest. He is seated by the Father in heaven. Verse 2, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. You see, the Old Testament, the, the tabernacle tent, or then later Solomon's temple, the reconstruction of that one, Herod's temple. These were all models of the reality that is in heaven. These were types. These were patterns for God's throne. But you see, the temple of Herod was still standing, and the priests were still functioning. Verse 3, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one, capital one, is referring to Christ, also have something to offer. If he were on the earth, he would not be a priest. Why does he say that? Well, he was of the tribe of Judah, not Levi. Since there are priests, again, notice the present tense. When this was written, the priests were still, this is prior to the destruction of the temple. There are priests who offer gifts according to the law. Verse 5, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he, that's God, told him, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Now, let's, uh, let's pause. The, the Greeks, and, and William Barclay goes into this a certain degree in his, in his commentary, but the Greeks had a, had a unique view of the universe as being two worlds. There is the real world, and there's the unreal world. They believed in models and types and patterns, that everything here on the earth is, 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 is a pattern, a model for something that is in heaven. Uh, the physical world was a, a model for the spiritual world, and, and Plato and other Greek philosophers viewed the world, and, and again, they had a lot of influence on the first century world, uh, which is why I bring them in. They saw the world as you know, the, 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 the earth as we know it, as a shadow 
uh, for the real world that was somewhere that they didn't understand. But he quotes from back in Exodus 25, verse 40, as God is giving the blueprint to Moses over a number of chapters there. See that you make it according to the pattern shown you on the mountains. The heaven, the earthly priests have a service that is a shadowy outline of the heavenly order. Then in verse 6, but now he, uh, Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant. There's that better, that word better again, which was established on better promises. So Paul, again, now he brings up the word covenant. That's twice here. He's going to be going to the new covenant. He's transitioning to a better covenant established on better promises. Those called to the church come under the new covenant. And again, now he's comparing and contrasting not priesthoods, but two covenants. The old covenant promised Israel uh, physical things like physical health and well-being, uh, multiplying in great numbers, uh, becoming a great people, peace, abundance, rain in due season. I mean, physical blessings of this physical life. But the new covenant promises eternal life, rulership in the kingdom, uh, perfection, forgiveness of sins, that God doesn't remember sin anymore. Jesus serves as mediator. A mediator stands between two parties and then brings them together. A mediator was also someone who was willing to pay the, a friend's debt in order to make things right. So we shift now to his discussion of the new covenant. Verse 7, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Now, covenant, it's, it's interesting, and again, William Barclay goes into it, but there is a, most of the time in Greek, there is a particular word that is used, and it's not the one that is used here. This word that is rendered covenant is diatheke, diatheke, D-I-A-T-H-E-K-E. And um, this other Greek word described agreements that were mutually entered into by two parties. Like if it was a business agreement, uh, we would say today a marriage is a, is a marital covenant. Uh, however, diatheke, let me scroll up, diatheke is a covenant for which only one of the parties is fully responsible. And the new, co new covenant is, is of that realm. Uh, it is a relationship offered solely on the initiative and the grace of God. God sets the terms. We cannot alter them in the slightest. Uh, but he makes very clear here the problem was, as, as verse 8 begins, finding fault with them. The problem was with carnal mankind, and who on their own strength could not keep the law. So in verse 8, he begins quoting with the word behold. He's quoting from back in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. And again, Jeremiah is writing this hundreds of years earlier. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. When Jeremiah wrote, the house of Israel had already fallen and gone off into captivity. Uh, he was of the house of Judah. He was watching it with his own, own eyes, the downfall of Judah. And um, the new covenant brings all of Israel and reunites them. 
Verse 9, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. You know, not, we're not talking about the one that was ratified by blood in Exodus 24 after God gave the Ten Commandments and the statutes. He's not talking about that one. Because they did not continue in my covenant. So the house of Israel departed, the house of Judah departed, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. Verse 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I, this is, this is a central thrust of the better covenant. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. So the intention behind every word of the spiritual law of God will be written on the hearts so it becomes a part of our nature. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 11, none of them shall teach his neighbor and none, none his brother saying, know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. Well, as this is fully uh, established, uh, Jesus Christ is sitting here on his throne reigning from Jerusalem. Verse 12, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. And talk about better promises. The issue of sin, the record of sin, will be completely covered and washed away. Well, verse 13. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first, okay, the first covenant covenant with national Israel is being rendered obsolete. Now what is becoming, again, this was a transition period. The temple was destroyed and there was no holy place. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So again, the temple is about to be destroyed. The Levites will no longer function. In fact, that whole system is about to disappear. In chapter 9, we go a little further, and we, we actually spend a lot of time looking at the tabernacle, all of its typology. And let me, let me scroll this up so you can see this, uh, this sketch that I found online. Uh, freeware. Um, chapter 9, the earthly sanctuary. Verse 1, then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. Okay. Moses, God's instruction of Moses for constructing the tabernacle and all of the accoutrements that go inside is found in Exodus chapters 25 to 31 and then 35 to 40. Many chapters in the latter part of Exodus are, are given just simply to describe uh, what, what we're going to be reading about here. In verse 2, for a tabernacle was prepared, the first part Okay, tabernacle, this is before even Solomon's temple. The original tabernacle tent that was portable that they, that they moved as they, as they were migrating. The first part. Okay, so looking at this sketch, here it actually has the, the 12 tribes, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, uh, but then it doesn't list Levi. They were given... Uh, they were given a, a different role here. Uh, there, there was this tent that goes all the way around. Uh, what is it? 75 feet by 150 feet, the best that, that can be told. Going into this gate, 
you see the priests could go here. Others were on the outside. A brazen altar, I, I should say Levites. Specifically into this inner tent or area of the tent, priests. Brazen altar, the bronze altar, the uh, labor of the water, the priests would wash themselves before officiating. Then you have this inner area that is 45 by 15 feet. You know, it's really not gigantic, but there was uh, a veil here where the priests would enter the holy place. So in this first room, that's what he means by saying the first part in which there was the lampstand. Here is the lampstand. Um, I believe the Hebrew word is, is menorah. There is also this table, and that's where the showbread was laid out. And there was an altar of incense. Now there was... I uh, forget the term for it, but something that, say, Aaron would carry to take some of the burning incense to go on the Day of Atonement back into the holy, the holiest of holies. But this is the first one. The, uh, as it says here, the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Verse 3, though, it discusses what is behind the second veil. Verse 3, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, or more commonly, we call it the holy of holies. Verse 4, which had the golden censer. Okay, that's it, this golden censer that the high priest would carry back because there was to be all this smoke from the incense uh, that, would, uh, that would be uh, going off as he was working there. And the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. That, that's the two tablets with the Ten Commandments. And above it were the cherubim of glory. Moses was told in Exodus 25 on, that, on the lid of that mercy seat, have the two carabine with their wings spread out. Um, okay, overshadowing the mercy seat of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. So it is a fascinating study to go into very uh, in-depth study. Every detail was instructive, uh, but again, it's, uh, it's not something we need to focus on right now. Now let me scroll this up a little further. Well, I think we're going to lose our uh, lose that, but I want to I want to cover some other things here. Uh, behind the second veil was the holiest of all. Only the high priest entered annually on atonement. It contained the Ark of the Covenant. Well, the Ark had. Um, let's see down here. Yes, it had Aaron's rod that budded that demonstrated that God was working through the tribe of Levi. This was the chapter after the story of the rebellion of Korah and 250 of the, the leaders of Israel. Uh, the rod also, also pictures God protecting his people, as in Psalm 23, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So that's the rod. It also had this golden pot with manna. The manna pictured Jesus as the true bread of life. And it reminded Israel of how God provided for them out in the wilderness, out in the desert for those 40 years. The uh, lid, of course, had the carabine. Okay, let's, uh, let's keep going here. In verse 6, now when these things had been prepared, it took that first year for everything to be put together. The priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. Now, 
Barclay, William Barclay has a note here, page 115 on his Hebrew, in his Hebrews volume. It was of all this beauty that the writer to the Hebrews was thinking, and yet it was only a shadow of reality. In his mind, there was another thing of which he was to speak again. The ordinary Israelite could come only to the gate of the tabernacle court. That's the outside tabernacle court. The priests and the Levites might enter the court. The priests alone might enter the holy place, and none but the high priest might enter the holy of holies. There was a beauty, but it was a beauty in which the ordinary people were barred from the inner presence of God. Jesus Christ took the barrier away and opened wide the way to God, God's presence for everyone. So I'm going to scroll back up to see the, the, uh, the sketch. You see, outside this wall, all of the 12 tribes had to stay outside. Through this gate, only Levites, including priests, could go. Then there was a way into the first room. Only priests could go there, not Levites. And behind the second veil, only the high priest one time every year. Okay, verse uh, verse 7, but in the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood. Okay, I just read this. Verse 8, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. So it was unavailable. There was no direct access to God until the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And I don't think I have it in my notes here, but when Jesus died, certain events took place like an earthquake. But also remember how the veil from top to bottom in that temple was torn. And that signified that the way was now made possible through Jesus Christ to have direct access to the Father. Verse 9, excuse me, verse 9, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect with regard to conscience. You see, there still is a remaining guilty conscience. The blood of bulls and goats could not do take away from that. Only the blood of Christ. Verse 10, concerning only, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. Well, time of the Reformation's uh, Reformation was brought by Jesus Christ and by what, what he did. Um, verse 11, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. So he says, I'm not referring back to the tabernacle tent that Moses followed the pattern and directed the efforts in building all of this. It's not of man's creation. Verse 12 not with the blood of bull of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So until Christ's own blood was offered, man was cut off from access to God. But now with that sacrifice, the age of the animal sacrifices is over. It's history. The blood of Christ justifies, it covers sins and allows access to the heavenly throne. In verse 13, for if the blood of bull, okay, I just read that. No, no, I didn't. Verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, remember uh, back in the law, the, uh, the red heifer, the burning of it, the keeping of the ashes, if someone was defiled, 
such as uh, touching dead bodies, then these ashes were used. Uh, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the sins. So, so if all of that had to do with purifying the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Verse 15, and for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So eternal redemption provides the promise of eternal inheritance. And I thought it would be good to put in my notes here, Romans 5 verses 8 through 11. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, we weren't worth dying for, but because of their love, God did it anyhow. Much more than having now been justified by his blood. You know, we are pronounced clean. We are pronounced righteous to be able to approach God we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And that's the ongoing life interceding as mediator on our behalf as high priest. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Okay, then let's let's just let's look here uh, at these last verses. In verse sixteen, for where there is a testament, now it's interesting that he has used the word diatheke before, but it was translated covenant, and now at this point, diatheke is translated as a testament denoting a will or some type of a legal contract. Where there is a, can I just say a will, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So each of us should have a will. And I realize when we're young, we think we're going to live forever. But, you know, it's, it's the counsel of the church, have a will. There are times when someone dies and there's no will and it's, it's chaos. It's, it's a sizable challenge and you're at the mercy of the court. But you see a will. We have our wills. When I die the will 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 be um, followed through on that you know my my wife or my children children only after i die receive this disbursement of things that i have accrued a will only goes into effect after the death of the one who made it and so what he's getting at is Jesus died. And so the new covenant went into effect. Verse 17, for a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. You can go back to Exodus 24, verses 1 through 8. Excuse me, Exodus 24, verses 1 through 8. The book of the covenant, the law, the statutes, Israel gathered there, the animals that are sacrificed, the blood. The blood is sprinkled far and wide on the book, on the people, just everywhere. And by the shedding of blood, the old covenant was put into effect. Verse 19, for when Moses had spoken every precept to the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats 
with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. And so that's a uh, that's, uh, quote from uh, back in Exodus 24. Verse 21, he, or then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Okay. Um, let's go on to verse 23. Just a few more verses where our time is about up. Verse 23, therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens, so the tabernacle, the lampstand, the table, the tent, the, the, the ark, everything, all of these co copies of what is in heaven should be purified, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. There's that word better again. And the better sacrifices is defined here in verse 24, for Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but in the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And so Jesus took his own blood before the Father in heaven and offered it for all of human sin for all time. Verse 26, he then would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin for salvation. So a better sacrifice, better covenant, better promises. And this fleshly life is temporary, and all who live as flesh and blood humans will ultimately wear out and die. Uh, however, also woven into this is there is a there will be a resurrection and there will be judgment. Of course, we're called now, so judgment is on us now. But after this physical life, we look to judgment pursuant to salvation and and, re and receipt of eternal life. Well, I think that's uh, that's where we're going to wrap it up. Uh, chapter ten continues on with this this theme of uh, the animal sacrifices being insufficient and and uh, Christ's death, um, and and just again another one of those uh, messages of hang on, hold fast, don't let it slip away from you. Okay, so next time we'll look at chapter 10 and then probably chapter 11. There's so much in chapter 11 with the, the Hall of Fame of Faith, men and women of faith. So uh, I'll go ahead and uh, stop share.